Good evening from uh, stormy, windy Nantucket. The sea is roaring out there, the winds are coming in off the ocean, and it's still raining and it's still windy here on this island. And I'll give you a look at that later. Uh, have a look at the ocean, see the, the rain coming down. Anyway, since I'm without a chalkboard or a blackboard or markers, I can only talk. To give these talks, and so that you don't forget me, I'll just give casual talks off the top of my head. I have no books up here either. I have access to a cell phone. That's what's taking the pictures. Anyway, never mind about that. The last day I began talking about Archimedes. I'm only taking great steps. There are many people in between the great people that I will talk about. I talked about Archimedes first. There are many people before I get to the next person. The next great person I'm going to talk about today, that's Galileo Galilei. And then it's going to be Newton next. But of course, there are many people in between Galileo and Newton, along, alongside Ga Galileo. For example, Johannes Kepler lived within the years a much shorter life when Galileo was alive. Johannes Kepler. So they were contemporaries completely, right? People before Galileo. Uh, Gilbert, who studied magnetism. Some great names, great uh, things. But Galileo did certain things which really have been built upon ever since. Now, first of all, I put some years into place. Uh, Galileo died in 19, sorry, 1642. Newton was born in 1643. Actually, it's debatable whether or not he was born in 1642 or 1643. Maybe he's a reincarnate of Galileo. I doubt it. One way or another, 1564 to 1642, that's Galileo's lifespan, and Newton's is 1643 to 1727. Now, in terms of his academic career, I'll begin the, the actual career in a minute, but just in terms of important years, 1589 to 1592, he was math chair at Pizza. Pisa, sorry, not pizza, that you eat pizza. Pisa, P-I-S-A, in Italy. The Leaning Tower at Pisa. People say he tested the law free fall off the, lead, the Leaning Tower of Pisa by dropping objects. I don't know for sure. I don't think anybody else does either, but it's a nice story. We'll go into those things in a minute. We'll go into his major contributions in a minute. Um, <clears throat> his ma major contributions were built upon by other people, such as Isaac Newton, many others, okay? Now, he was given a chair in Pisa, chair of mathematics. He had many sponsors. The Medici, he had two Medicis sponsoring him. And when he discovered the moons of Jupiter, he named them after members of the Medici family. So from 1692, sorry, 1592 to 1610, he was chair of math at Padua. But before that, 1589 to 1592, he was mathematics chair at Pisa. I should say mathematics, not math, mathematics. 1609, at Padua, that major university there, he was given tenure for life. Then he lasted until uh, the year of his death. He was there, I guess, 1642. Um, let me get that right another time. Anyway, one way or another, he did many things in his career. Galileo. Let's begin with one of his first major discoveries, which kind of made him famous. He was in the cathedral at Pisa. And now in Catholic cathedrals, I don't know if they're probably in Anglican ones as well, there is a thing called the sanctuary light, which is a very long pendulum, lamp on a pendulum, which has to be lighted when what they call the Blessed Sacrament is present in the, on the altar and in the tabernacle. So that stays lighting all the time. Even when I was growing up, I remember them. And they're on a big, long uh, pendulum wire, if you like. And if there's a little bit of a breeze at all, they'll tend to oscillate. Galileo noticed that the pendulum oscillated at a constant rate. He timed it with his pulse. And he found that that's, this did not vary, no matter how big the angle. Well, that's, you say, is not very important. That's extremely important. It was that discovery which enabled him to study motion, because that's coming up. 
He allowed objects to roll down inclines. Wait a minute, it's no use if you can't time these things. Before uh, Galileo, uh, his realization of the fact that the pendulum had a regular swing, the period was constant, uh, independent of the mass on the end of it, it only depended on the length of the string, he figured that one out. That allowed him to make a timing device. So this is the new timing device now. The pendulum, with its regular swings, replaced water clocks, uh, sand clocks, and any other kind of timing device, such as uh, irreliable, unreliable pulses on people, or uh, whatever else. The pendulum was a pretty accurate way of timing things. Now that enabled Galileo A to get known, right? Get the chair of mathematics at Pisa. Why mathematics? Galileo discovered something very important. He actually said this up front. You could probably Google it somewhere. He said, and he discovered and realized for the first time that mathematics was the language of the universe. He says this up front. We now know this to be true. To understand the universe and everything in it, you have to have the language of mathematics under control. That's one of his major steps forward. Another one of the major steps forward is, he said, in order to understand the universe, we must use a logical approach. We must use what's called the scientific method nowadays. In other words, check things by experiment. If Galileo comes along and he said this, if I drop two balls, irrespective of the mass, wasn't so sure about the mass just yet, but the weight, irrespective of the weight of each ball, they all fall at the same rate. Now that meant he had to go out and drop spheres, or any shape you want, and drop them and observe their motion. Now that doesn't say he sees one hit the ground first and the other one later, because that could happen if you don't drop them at the same time. But he sees that as they fall, one doesn't catch up or pass out the other and do that. In other words, they keep the same distance apart mutually once dropped. He actually rolled things down inclines. Now what does that mean? Well, rolling down an incline, you had to have friction involved. Galileo was one of his great steps forward, was the ability to take away friction and air resistance and come up with a deduction. Hence the law of inertia. Things will keep on moving forever, according to Galileo, unless act upon by an outside force. The outside force could be a push or a pull, air resistance or fr surface friction or any of those things. Force wasn't defined at this time, but any kind of interference is the motion is what he's thinking about, right? Now, in uh, 1608, 1608, or was it 1508? Let me check. 1608. Um, a guy in Holland, right, who was a lens maker, actually there was two people in Holland at the same time did the same thing discovered how to make a telescope. In other words, a convex lens here and a convex lens there, refractive lenses, can bring th make things appear closer. Galileo heard about this one year later, in 1609, and he made his own telescope. He didn't come up with the idea, but he perfected it at the time, or at least he improved upon it. There are two of Galileo's tennis telescopes, uh, very ornately fashioned in the Science Museum in Florence that can be watched and visited today. You can go and see him. Now, once Galileo has the telescope, he took, aside, he took an aside from his studies. Basically, he was studying kinematics. He was studying free fall, you know, displacement, speed, velocity, if you like, and acceleration. What happens to things that they accelerate? What's the mathematics of them? Free fall? Distance fall is a half times the acceleration due to gravity times t squared. Half g t squared, if you like. Galileo was studying this stuff on inclined plane motion and timing things because he had this pendulum now. But he got distracted now because he had the telescope. What a wondrous thing to have. But his great idea was not to be looking at armies down the road, not to be looking at people in through their windows, not to be looking at people in the street down. He looked up. When you looked up, what's the first thing you're going to look at if you look at the night sky? Well, if the moon, moon is out, you look at the moon. First thing you notice, wait a minute, that moon, it's got mountains on it. It's substantial, possibly just like the Earth. And he made that statement, a statement to the effect that the moon was substantial, 
Maybe just like the earth, but at least it's a possibility. Next thing he studied, he studied, well, he probably studied the moons of Jupiter next, but let's say he studied the phases. He studied Venus, and he noticed it had phases just like the moon, it was just smaller. It would wax and wane. Galileo deduced that it was picking up light from the sun and that the earth was probably doing the same thing. He thought the earth is going to be just like Venus, just another planet. And, it's, and we happen to be standing on it. But there's Venus out there with phases. There's the moon up there with phases. And here's Jupiter. It's got phases too. He, he came across these observations and he started putting two and two together. He had a picture of the solar system now in his head and he adopted the Copernican viewpoint, for which he got penalized. <laughs> a friend of his became Pope, Pope Urban VIII. Now, they were good buddies. The Jesuits and the Vatican accepted, actually, the Copernican point of view, until Galileo came out and made a mistake. He published his book, The Dialogue, and there was a guy in there called Simplicio, Simplicio, simple guy. That was supposed to be Urban VIII, and Urban VIII was, um, a he was not. He was not a. He was a earth-centered universe. I think it's the Ptolemy part, point of view, and so he got annoyed with Galileo, and he had him punished through an inquisition. Now, Galileo was then put under house arrest. He died. I guess for, he was there for ten years. I guess where, what year was it? Um, He died in 1642, so that Inquisition must have been 1632 because he was in house arrest for 10 years, the last 10 years of his life. When his sister, sorry, his daughter, Maria Celeste, whose original name was Virginia, he had three children out of wedlock, he thought that he would never get her married off, so he sent her into a convent. And she died prematurely in a convent. That's Maria Celeste, his daughter. And there's a book out by Galileo called Galileo's Daughter. I think it's by Sobel. I'm not sure you can check it on the web. It would be an interesting read. I probably have it myself. I just haven't gotten around to looking at it. So Galileo. What else can I say about Galileo? Oh yes, we're talking about uh, his viewing the planets in his telescope and he, he adopted the Copernican viewpoint. That got him house arrest and he stayed in actually luxury. He stayed in various different villas during the year, so it's not like he, he, as if he was imprisoned or being scourged in a dungeon. No, no, he had it reasonably comfortably. Okay, what else can I say that Galileo did that's of interest? Well, he figured out how to grind lenses. He saw mountains on the moon, we said that. Geocentric, we said that. Um, Oh yes, what happened, what got him in trouble was that he wrote a letter about his view on the uh, Copernican view of the world and he, the, some of the Dominican fathers got a hold of it and they sent it to Rome. That's when Rome, you know, started to chase after him first. I said that Kepler was a contemporary. That'll do on that. Now listen, I have to say that that's Galileo, and Galileo is looking at the mechanical universe. The mechanical universe, that was a great uh, TV show some time ago. But the mechanical point of view, he studied mechanics, early mechanics, and gravitation, and motion. Now, but there, is other, there are other things. Nowadays we perceive the world in terms of classical mechanics, and in terms of field theory for electricity and magnetism, and then the quantums, quantum fields and so on. But there is the view of the world that is mechanical, and there's the view of the world which is to do with fields. Now what kind of early studies of fields do we have? Well we have William Gilbert from England, Colchester, England, I'll give you some years, 1544 to 1603. Queen Elizabeth I died in 1603. Uh, Gilbert was her Physician, isn't that interesting? That's as far as I know. Anyway, Gilbert uh, viewed the Earth as a big magnet. He studied magnets. 
he knew that when you split a magnet, you got two small magnets. And he identified north and south poles. He discussed a lot of this stuff in a book published in... Um, I don't have a year for that, but he published a book called De Magnete. I'd love to get my hands on it. It would be a classic to read. And it's looking at the world in terms of this. Gilbert coined the phrase electricicus. And uh, Tom, Thomas Brown, Sir Thomas, in 1646, adopted Gilbert's term electricicus, which means uh, light amber. And he called it electricity when he talked about the, you know, what is electricity when you get a spark, let's say, from static electricity and so on and so forth. That's the kind of things they were studying. And of course, the relationship, it wasn't known that magnetism and electricity were even related, okay? But it turns out that magnetism and electricity were. Gilbert was studying both of them, but he had a view of them separately. It was only when Hans Oersted came along that the fact that a magnetic field will surround a current carrying a a wire carrying a current of electricity and you can check it by moving your compass. You have a current going, let's say, in a straight line and you take a little magnet and you go around it and it'll keep pointing in circles around this current. Biosavar made a law about that later on but Hans Christian Oerset first of all observed this. Now this is the way we're going. That was the big step. Galileo, you can say an awful lot more about Galileo. There's a fantastic play by Bertolt Brecht on the life of Galileo. I saw it once on TV. I'd love to get my hands on the book. The next time I'll talk more about that play, I'll get some details on it. I'm lacking a lot of details because you could write that much on Galileo. Anyway, that's enough for today. I'm going to uh, post this just so that you guys don't forget about me. And the next time we talk, I'll talk about Newton. As I talk about the major figures, I will throw in secondary figures as well. For example, this time I threw in Gilbert and Brown. There are many other people. I also threw in Kepler. Actually, I should talk about Kepler as a separate story. He had a short life, he wasn't well, he had bad teeth and he was very ill. And he was devastated when he found out the laws of, elect of planetary orbits defined orbits as being conic sections, ellipses. He thought they should be circles. Anyway, that's a separate idea. Let's stop it there and you can have a look at the ocean. Actually, let's ha have a look at the ocean right now. Here's the ocean out here. As you can see. Look at those waves, 10, 15 feet high. It's a pretty mild day today. Okay then, we're going to wrap it up. My son drives that down there, back in here. We haven't gone hunting for a while. It's a bit too windy. You can't really fire bows off with arrows like that in the wind. It could come back to haunt you. Okay, then, till next time, and that's Sankey Lighthouse, a picture of it over there. That's why I do my calculations at the desk. What have I got going here? Oh yeah, I have no typing. So I have to, I'm working on a handwritten uh, write-up on supergravity.